yes, thank you once again for inviting me. Um, I hope you can see me and um, I'm audible enough. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. So, yes, I was saying that I would like to thank you sincerely for inviting me to present to your students um, about how international or multinational organizations go about their recruitment. And so, before I start, I'd just like to tell you a bit about myself. My name is Mrs. Daphne Opon. I'm the Regional Head of Human Resource currently at Ecobank Ghana and the Anglophone West African region. I have worked with Ecobank for 15 years now and it's been an absolute pleasure working for a pan-African institution that um, tries to replicate and indeed imbibes best practice international and global standards in all that it does. So that is what I do. I'm a mother of two children, two lovely boys. I'm a leader, I'm a strategist, I communicate well, I'm empathetic, and I, above all, I think that the qualities that I use to guide my, my self principles is that I take integrity to be my utmost guide in all that I do. I feel that without integrity, I would not have you know, um, gone through my career to this end. And so I would encourage and urge all the young and upcoming ones to take integrity seriously and be a value that they support strongly. So let's talk about recruitment. Recruitment is an important exercise in any organization, whether it's a, it's a multinational, whether it's, a, it's a, a sole proprietorship, whether it's a partnership, whatever business or institution, recruitment is important because one organization has to be progressed in the interview, in the um, presentation, you realize that a bad recruitment can mess up an entire business strategy. And so it's important that you look critically at how you recruit and select people into your organization. Now we'll make a distinction between what recruitment is and what selection is because they are not the same, but most of the times we try to in, use them interchangeably. Now recruitment is a broader subject under HR strategic plan. Okay, so it's part of a bigger HR strategy. Uh, and the goal of HR strategic planning is to create an alignment to the organization's strategic plan and the establishment of ongoing systems that will ensure the availability of skilled, and I'd like us to emphasize skilled and competent workforce that can support the organization achieve its strategic goals. So you have a strategy to be a pan-African institution. So I'm looking, I'm taking Ecobank as an example. Yeah. Our strategy is to be a pan-African bank where we identify ourselves in all African countries if possible and where the regulator will allow us to set up. So if that is our goal, how do we then identify the right people who will then be able to represent us the goals and the foundation, the values and the principles of the founders of the bank, how will we be able to identify people, human beings? Because if we are setting up banks across Africa, systems and machines are not going to run the bank. It will be human beings that will drive the systems. And so we need to be able to think forward and decide who we're looking for, what caliber, when do we need them? how are we going to recruit them and how are we going to maintain them in the organization to retention. And so it is a very critical um, topic in HR planning. Without people in your organization, it's just uh, an entity, buildings and equipment and nothing will, will be driven. 
So human beings and finding the correct, the right skilled and competent workforce is critical for the success of every organization. Now, the aim, again, the importance or the essence of the human uh, resource planning, as we have already said, is that it is to support the organization to reach the long-term business goal. It is also to help HR planning, and, and the HR planning process precedes recruitment and selection. So before you, um, as an organization, before you go about, um, where's the video? I can't even find the video. Yeah. Before an organization can decide, sorry, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. I'm listening. Okay, so the slide has moved and it's not moving again. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Uh, yeah, it, but it's stable. Yes. Uh, do I need to start again? No, not necessarily. What you can do is uh, you can um, move out from the sharing or just on share and then put bring a, a share again and then let's see what it will do. Just take it out from the share screen and then over again and then let's see what. Yeah, because now it's not even moving. My slides are not moving. Okay. So let me stop sharing. It's all over again. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you continue. You can continue. I just okay, let me stop the recording and the rest of the video. All right. Okay. So I'll share my screen again. And then we progress with the presentation. <laughs> So can you see my screen now again? I can see this. Okay. So before the aim of human resource planning, as we have already said, is to support the organizations to reach long-term business goals. It is also um, HR planning must always precede recruitment and selection. And it is a way of providing the foundation for staffing. So as I said, you cannot set up an entity and um, not have human beings actually uh, man the organization. And so it's important that at all times we have human beings and the right type of human beings um, manning your organization. And so the ultimate test of HR planning system at all times is whether it provides the right number of people with the right skill sets in the organization at any point in time, if your organization is going to be successful, it is important that you ensure that through your HR planning activities, you have the right number of people at all times to support your organizational goals. And this requires careful analysis of the organization's current workforce and estimate of how the future business demands will be met. Now your current um, employee workforce actually talks about your supply of human um, resources. So the supply of human resource is all about whether you have the right level of staffing in your uh, business at any point in time. And so you must look inside your organization to determine whether or not you have adequate um, skills. If you have enough uh, resources in your organization, there is no need to go out there searching for additional talent. What you now need to do is to focus on your existing talent and to plan and find out whether the current talent you have will actually be able to meet your future demands. That is the strategic plan of the organization. So sometimes, um, you're moving into a new field of business, for example, and you need a highly skilled technical workforce in technology. People who are programmers, for example, 
if you look within and you do not have the skill set, then it's important that you begin to look out and find the right um, set of people who will be able to meet your demands of programming, software developers, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to meet with the demands. If you look, take the bank as an example, with COVID breaking out, the, with the pandemic, um, most banks and institutions tend, um, began to transact more and to leverage more on their digital platforms. And so for companies that were not able to um, adopt to the realities of the situation and begin to serve customers seamlessly on digital platforms, some of them have had to fold up, some of them have lost customers to competition. And so at any point in time, you must plan ahead and know the direction of the organization and how prepared you are with your workforce to be able to meet the future demands. So it is at the point where you know what you're looking for in the long term, the medium to long term, that you decide whether you're going out to recruit or not. And recruitment, as I would like to define it, um, is that is the process of identifying potential employees and encouraging them to apply for job openings. So that is recruitment. You have a need to be able to attract a certain talent. And so it's important that you go out there and look for candidates, candidates with the right skills, the right competencies to meet your strategic objective. So as I said, again, if you're looking for programmers, um, people with some, some level of technical skills in, in IT, whatever it is, you must go out searching for CVs and candidates who actually possess these skills. You don't just go out and say, I am recruited and so any application at all, because you will receive tons and tons of applications. But if you're able to put in filters to screen the number of candidates you're looking for, it helps you when you get to the stage of selection to only pick those that you need because you know exactly what you're looking for. Now the goal is to attract a pool of qualified candidates and the focus is on the quality of applicants. That is why you must be able to, um, whatever job you're looking for, you must be able to put um, filters in there so that it sifts out only the right kind of people you're looking for, for the future job or position that you have. Now, when we, let's look at selection. Selection, unlike recruitment, is the actual process of hiring employees among shortlisted candidates and providing them with a job in the organization. So that is selection. And that's why I'm saying recruitment is quite different from selection, okay? So the selection is the process of hiring those candidates you have, uh, the pool of candidates that you have been able to screen from your recruitment exercise and shortlisting them through interviews. And there are various forms of interviews that you can do to select the best candidate that you want for the job vacancies that are available. Oh, and as I said earlier, can you hold on a bit here? Yes, you just mentioned a few interesting things I want us to just to look at. You just identifying potential employees. Now, what are the basic things that you look for? What makes somebody a potential employee? That, that those are those are some of the things that you have to look at so that you know the practical thing. Yes, uh, the potential okay. employee. What how do you? Look at that. Mm -hmm. So employees, uh, employers will look for various kinds. So let me start from entry level. So if a multinational organization or even institution at all is looking for entry level, we are not looking for people just because they have a degree qualification. Now, what would distinguish you from others at the time of selection? Because at the recruitment, if we say the, ba the basic requirement is a degree, and it doesn't specify what degree it is. And everybody with any kind of degree is a qualified um, candidate. Now, when it comes, you must be able to distinguish yourself. So we're looking for people with general business competencies, people with interpersonal skills, people with strong communication skills, people who have some, can demonstrate some level of business acumen, for example, people who may have some technical establishment, perhaps in, um, financial modeling, 
um, using Excel, using a uh, PowerPoint presentation, people who perhaps have uh, certain cultural exposures. These are think people who are bilingual and multilingual. So we are working in a global um, environment right now. And so anything, any little thing that you have that is a little unique from what the general, the, the, the bigger group has, quite distinguishes you from um, a pool. So these are things that we're looking for and people who present themselves as purposeful. So you don't come and you say, I'm, I want to be a manager in a bank. How do you become a manager? You say that you want to leverage your, perhaps if it's only academic experience that you have and you've been able to support yourself to, to be able to support yourself with these um, technical unique capabilities and competencies that I've mentioned. You say that you, you will leverage because you've been able to do these things on your own, aside the formal degree you have ad acquired for yourself, you would like to leverage the business goals and whatever the business will be able to support yourself, leverage that with the skills and competencies that you bring on board to add value to the organization. So we're looking for, most organizations are looking for people with certain unique qualities. And those are some of the things I've mentioned, especially for entry level, just basic communication skills, interpersonal skills. Now, somebody who is maybe strong with social media, um, sales and marketing, for example, because that is the world that we are in now, how to be able to project the organization, not only through um, the, the traditional newspaper and radio, whatever, but also how to reach, have a wide reach on social media handles um, and social media platforms, etc. So these are some of the things that would distinguish one candidate for, from another. Now, when we go to middle level, we are looking for more accomplished, how successful you have been over the years, where you have worked for. So you can give examples, for example, of how you were able to lead a project and a team to, uh, to reach a certain um, business goal and target that, that led the organization to you know, reach a certain height as opposed to competition. So at that middle level, you actually want to um, distinguish yourself by talking about your achievements and your successes and the lessons you've learned um, as you have progressed in your career etc cetera, etc cetera. when we look at the leadership level then you're looking at how you have been able to perhaps um, lead uh, businesses and to reach the, uh, the, the, the hilt of or the height of um, business success uh, within a certain uh, industry how you have been able to lead teams for example to achieve the greatest uh, potentials and distinguish yourself as industry players and industry um, experts, et cetera, et cetera. You must be able to talk about perhaps your strengths in mergers and acquisitions and, you know, strong business uh, uh, rallying people to, to derive um, business success is what we're looking for when you're talking about uh, recruiting at the leadership level and also people who have multicultural exposure and people who are able to work with different um, um, institutions and negotiate at the very high level is what we look for when it's at that senior level. I hope I've been able to answer your questions with regards to what qualities we look for when we are recruiting. Yes, yes. Well, that's important because it means that there are some of these things that you have to cultivate them alongside your education, your normal what, getting your degree, et cetera, some of these things, you have to do that before you even yeah, you get yourself ready as part of the skill sets required to be able to meet the requirements that you really look for. Okay, you can continue. Exactly. Okay, so recruitment in multinational organizations, we need to also think about diversity and inclusion. In a multinational organization, you find yourself in different, different places ac across the globe. And so you need to ensure that you are bringing in different people from different backgrounds. You cannot say that you are going to focus on certain cultures and certain nationalities only because your business is diverse. You need to be able to open up to different people with different backgrounds and also meet with international um, regulations. 
and diversity, as you know, brings about a strong and a rich pool of talent that can help you drive and be an industry player and an industry leader. So that is what you must look out for when you are actually uh, recruiting at, in, in multinational organizations. So you have to look at your cultural gaps. So if you are a parent company sitting in Ghana, for example, and you are looking to hire or set up in maybe South Africa or Europe somewhere, you need to be able to make sure that the skills and the workforce that you're recruiting across to those um, new regions and sectors that you are expanding to, you understand the culture. And so even if you are sending people from your head office, there must be people who understand the culture of the people in order for you to be able to survive well um, within the organization. You must be able to remotely onboard new staff. So you must be able to find platforms where you don't necessarily have to travel, travel across the globe to be looking for uh, resources and talents. You must be able to leverage on tools like LinkedIn and other platforms where you seep, you seep, you seep out for the best um, talent across. You must be able to find out the best uh, recruitment and selection procedures and strategies that you need to go through to ensure that you are um, operating globally, wherever you're sitting from, you are able to reach out to the best um, employees and workforce that are possibly available out there. Um, for international or multinational organization as well, you have to understand the um, uh, employment and regulations that are available in all the areas and regions and countries that you want to set up in because if you breach any labor practice regulation you yeah. will be in trouble your business will be collapsed your business will be shut down so these are understanding that you must get as an hr leader and in multinational organizations these are things that are critical to the success and survival of the businesses so if you are looking again for uh, recruiting uh, expatriates, people from outside because you're expanding or you need technical resources to come and support you drive a strategy, it's important that you understand the visas and work permits requirements that um, are required for the places where you want to post these resources to. But the most important thing that we must also um, understand in recruitment is that as an employer, you must be able to brand yourself correctly. Without a good branding, and, and branding comes from marketing, the marketing strategies. If you do not brand yourself correctly as a viable employer, you will search and search and search, and you will just not find the right talent. Just because you throw out a recruitment process and you get a million applications, does not mean that um, you are getting the right applicants to come into your organization. It is important that you strategically position yourself as an employer of choice and that you have value for people that you are uh, looking to hire and that you expect value from the people also that you are um, going to hire. And how do you um, project yourself as an employer of choice? Uh, you must ensure that your remuneration, for example, is competitive. You must ensure that you have learning and development systems um, in, well in place that are also aligned with international best practices. You must ensure that you are able to retain your um, employee workforce because you have good learning and development um, procedures in place to support your um, employees. And that's overall, you show a strong employee engagement um, uh, in your organization because disengaged staff will not give you any kind of uh, positive feedback out there to be able to attract you know, others from joining your institution for that diversity that you're looking out for. So it is important that as a multinational organization, you also brand yourself correctly as the preferred employer of choice. Now, let's look at the recruitment processes that most multinationals do. So the recruitment process includes attracting potential job applicants. We've already spoken about this. 
From the external labor market, every organization must attract sufficient job candidates who have the necessary abilities and aptitude. You don't just want anybody for the sake of adding numbers to your workforce, but you're looking at skilled and competent employees. So it's critical that you ensure that whatever job adverts or positions that you're looking for, first of all, you, 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 the job posting must be right with the right a wording in terms of the job analysis, the job specification, and you know, attracting the right people for the right jobs. So selection procedures are limited by the effectiveness of the recruitment procedure. So if you have your job descriptions right, if you've clearly spoken about the rights, uh, the specification of the job, the qualification criteria, you know, and so on and so forth. It will be easier to sift out, as I mentioned earlier, the applications that you're not looking for, for any position. And so it will only limit you to the pool of potentials that you would like to take through your next process of the recruitment process. So let's look at the process itself. So you have to formulate a recruitment strategy, okay? And so the recruitment strategy, again, must align with the strategic objectives of the organization. Where is the organization heading to? What kind of people are they looking for? Where will they find them from? Are you going to look for, a are you going on, on campuses, for example, to, look, to do job fairs and selecting graduate trainees out of that? So you just have to have a strategy based on the kind of uh, vacancies that you're looking to attract people into. So you search for the job applicants. And again, whatever, once you know what you're looking for, that is how you will be able to search for your job applicants. And you, you must decide where you're searching them from, from schools, from LinkedIn, from other social media platforms, from, from employee referrals, from client referrals. You just need to know where what you're looking for first and where you're going to find those candidates from. Sometimes you may even be looking for them. Sorry. Yes, okay. okay, so what do you look at the moment? What are some of the uh, combinations that you, you, um, you employ um, when it comes to the do you do school uh, fair, um, uh, what a, job fairs on, the, on campuses or something? What, how do you, what do you do practically? So for organizations that I'm, I'm currently I'm used to or I've managed over the years, we have applied a varied, um, um, various strategies in attracting campus, um, candidates. We've get done campus fairs. Um, recently, we did quite a number of campus fairs. We went to Ashesi. We've gone to, um, I think, the University of Ghana campus before. In some other organizations that I've worked with, we were all around the major universities at the time. It was Ghana University, it was the University of Ghana, and I think University of Cape Coast. So we've been there where we talk about what the organization is, and that is where we sell our value proposition. That is where we sell ourselves as an organization for us to be attracted to the job market, to the candidates in school, to say that yes, um, company A, company B is or should be your preferred choice of employer. This is what we can give you if you come in um, uh, as, a, as a candidate that we're looking for, and this is what we will also expect from you as a candidate you're looking for. We have also gone on social media to look for, um, uh, and I'm not talking specifically for my bank that I work with, but in other areas that I've worked with. We've also gone on social media to look for candidates. And indeed, when we are looking for specific skills, sometimes you go to actual competition to try and poach. That is also available because you're looking for a certain skill, a certain talent, and somebody who is credible on the industry to also help you lead and drive your strategy. So those are um, some of the things that we do and we have done over the years to attract and select candidates. Okay. So now, just hold on a minute. You just mentioned something that I think you, I want you to explain a little bit about. Now, what, how do you use the social media thing? Because um, on some, in some discussions, we look at the, the good side of it and also the other disadvantages of it. People put all sorts of things on social media. Okay. 
and sometimes even it, it affects the, even the so-called the professional ones as well. They put all sort of things. How does it affect it? How do you how do you look at them? How does that how do you use it in the decision making in recruitment processes? Okay, so once again, the filters are important. You must have a clear job that you're looking for, and that job, the job description that you post out there, must have clear you know, job specification, your, and, and be able to um, drill down into specifically what qualifications, skills and competencies, experiences that the organization is looking for before you are qualified. If you are able to do that, setting your filters well, you won't just have any junk because once you put um, an advert in social, on social media, you will probably have the whole world <laughs> able to apply. Yeah. But if you are able to put in the filters well, so it also depends on how strong your recruitment tools are. And so it's important that for an organization to go on to social media, you must be able to set your recruitment uh, platform such that it's able to filter out um, candidates that you are not looking for. And indeed, if you don't have those in-house, those filters in-house to you know, be able to even select and throw out candidates that you, are, uh, you, you don't need. You can always contract a third party to help you to, you know, put in filters and to be able to screen out candidates that are unwanted and only bring you those that are fit for your purpose at any particular point in time. So it's all about, first of all, getting your job description right and certain filters that will eliminate unwanted um, applicants. From your perspective, so, perspective, what are some of the undesirable things that you um, um, the no knows on it, uh, on let's say social media for you from as a as a recruitment uh, professional? What are some of the undesirable? The, the, the undesirable characteristics, the things that you don't have to like you when you see on social media in somebody's. Um, um, on social media or the sort of thing that will put somebody here, yeah, a recruiter off, that like, say that undesirable characteristics of a particular person or a particular um, uh, potential empo empo uh, employee. Okay, so well, it's important that you know when to go and look for undesirable characteristics. Okay, so um, there's a stage before you offer anybody an employment. Um, and I think that we will talk about that further when we progress in the um, discussion. But you know, you cannot, when you, when you identify a candidate, you don't just give a job offer, you give a contingent job offer. Because, um, I mean, in Ghana, our labor policy says that when you hire somebody, you give a, a, a person a contingent offer, you give them up to six months. Uh, whilst you test their ability, capabilities from what they say they could do, you know, and how they presented themselves during the selection process. So you give them a contingent offer and during that six months probationary period as well, you are supposed to do a background check, a thorough background check. Now, this background check is at the point where, this is the point where you can actually go on to their social media handles, see what they have posted over the years. So that's why it's important when we talk to young uh, students and young adults to say that you have to be mindful what you put out there because it's a record of your traits, your character traits, you know, um, and things that will, will naturally also come to fall, to display when you get into uh, an organization. If you're a cantankerous character, for example, on social media, it is likely that an organization will recruit you and indeed that character will be exhibited you know, within the organization. So you may be a very qualified, competent um, person on paper, but the employees also, employers also recruit for character. Okay, everybody wants peace and sanity within their institution. And so what you post there, your history and your records of what you've posted there. And remember, we also do academic background checks. We also do um, reference checks. 
And so these are all things that an employer must do and thoroughly do before a, a substantive job offer is extended to any uh, candidate that they wish to hire. Now, legally, it is important that we also bear in mind that legally, for a global organization, you can decide to decline um, offering somebody a job if you find anything adverse um, within uh, your background checks that you have conducted and also the reference checks that you conduct on that person. You are able to decline the person that substantive offer. And so these are things that an organization must do before um, offering somebody a substantive contract. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Okay, great. And so um, after screening out the unfit applicants, you then maintain a pool of up applicants. Remember, this is the recruitment process. This is not the selection process. So based on the skills, competencies, academic background, um, qualifications, years of experience that you're looking for based on the job specifications that you put out there, the filters will help you to put down the right candidates that you will now maintain as your candidate pool. And it is from this candidate pool that you actually go ahead to do your selection from. Now, I based my uh, presentation on recruitment because that was a topic that was given. And again, I've said that recruitment is quite different from, from selection. So let's again drill down into the recruitment strategies that um, are important in coming out with the best of candidates that you, 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 you can possibly get right from the recruitment into the selection process. First and foremost, as I've already said, your recruitment strategy must align with your overall organizational objective. Whatever that you're looking to do long term, if it's to expand, if it's to look for programmers, if it's to look for um, cash handlers, if it is to look for researchers and scientists, you just need to know what your strategy is and be able to direct your strategy towards that um, need you know, of the organization. You now need to also look at then who are you looking for and when do you need these people? Why do you need them and how are you going to get them? We've already talked about some of them. So who are you looking for? We are looking for a specialist who can, uh, an IT programmer, a software developer, who can now develop apps for us, you know, mobile apps, for example, to be able to transact if it's a banking organization. We're looking for, if it's maybe a recruitment company, we're looking for somebody who can design a recruitment platforms for us that will be able to, you know, consider some of these filters that we are talking about and use applications to actually find out, um, uh, screen out and sift out uh, chaff from the real candidates you're looking for. We are looking for someone who can design aptitude uh, and occupational questions, uh, testing platforms for us to be able to screen our candidates from and so on and so forth. So these are all things that you must consider as part of your recruitment strategy. When do you need the people to come in? So if you are looking to hire people in the next six months, then your strategy must be such that you are able to target a certain qualified pool of applicants who will be able to be onboarded by the time that you need them to start or you need to start you know, orienting them into your organization, actually put, recruiting them into you, selecting them into your, your your organization. So the when is very important because when your strategy is to um, reach maybe five African countries in the next two years, and you don't even know who your candidate pool are, where you're going to recruit them from, how you're going to recruit them, that is a problem. You need to be able to um, know when and be able to plan accordingly. Why are you recruiting them? Are you recruiting them because your business growth depends on having skills like that, people with set that, those kind of skills. Are you recruiting them because you want to be a household name and therefore you must be spread out in terms of your branches must be spread out across a country or across a, a, a region? Then you must look for a lot of, um, uh, for example, if you're a bank or if you're a retail um, company, you must look for a lot of sales force 
and so that you'll be able to realize your strategy of being a household name and have a lot of people recruited for at the right time and posted in those spaces. How are you going to recruit them? Are you going to use a third party agency to help you recruit? Are you going to look for um, um, temporary highs from another a company that already recruits? Are you going to go on campuses and do job fairs? Are you going to go on social media to look for people? Are you going to ask employees to help you uh, with employee referrals? Or you're going to go to the competition and coach? These are questions you must ask yourself as you go along your recruitment exercise. You must also ensure that your recruitment strategy is realistic and achievable and it must be easy to communicate to people. So you are recruiting, but the, what you are recruiting for or how you have posted your recruitment need is not clear. You are recruiting, you, you want to um, select maybe 100,000 people in the next month. Is that realistic? So these are things you must break your recruitment strategy into bits and achievable um, units so that you plan accordingly and also break your strategy um, in, in, in such a way that at every point in time, you give yourself the right time and room to search for the best candidates at the right time. And so your communication out there must also be clear in terms of what you're looking for at any point in time in order to get what you're looking for. You must also consider, again, depending on the timelines and what you're looking out for, you want to know whether you want to actually add to your headcount. That comes with a lot of overheads or you're looking to hire temporary people so that if they are not good enough, you can easily change. And at every point in time, you are able to change. That is why uh, most companies and banks also use our source staff, for example. And so for tellers and basic entry, um, basic entry jobs, most companies try to use temporary staff because sometimes um, look at the way um, the, 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 the pandemic has now shown that we need to be able to transact more using the digital platforms. And so if all your workforce are permanent and suddenly you are no longer um, requiring the use of brick and mortar branches and buildings, where will you put all these staff? you're going to declare a serious uh, redundancy exercise that will impact so negatively on your uh, company profile, your goodwill, and your company image. And so sometimes it's important that you have a blend of skilled permanent headcount as well as skilled temporary headcount. So depending on how the strategy goes, you can always let go of temporary staff because there's a different contractual relationship that you have with them and it's easier. It doesn't have the long labor issues that um, you will ordinarily have with full-term employees. So those are considerations you must also um, have in mind when you're recruiting. Depending on where you are recruiting for, you must also consider whether you're looking, you're going to look for local resources or you're going to look for expatriates. And it all depends on your strategy as well, aligning with the business strategy, where exactly you must, um, you are venturing the territories you are going to, what the labor requirements are, what the regulatory and, and government requirements are. And so you decide what you want to do and how that um, sector, that region, that um, geography will also accept either local or foreign expatriates. You need to look at all of that before you go in to recruit. So a clear plan that explains what to recruit for is important. And that is all part of a, a certain HR planning, human resource planning that you must do. So if you remember at the beginning of my presentation, I said that the human resource plan must always precede your recruitment and selection process. I hope this is clear up to this stage. So, sorry? Yes, um, you, did, you did mention that interviews, the process, the selection process. You, you talk about um, interview. You did say that you can't talk about interview. So we would like you to look at, just look at 
some of the types of interview that is that is applied and then how um, it is done basically and then sort of them. But now we are talking from uh, I like you to talk about we are talking from the point of view of the applicant, not the manager point of view. Okay, because most of the time it's the person who is if you're talking from the manager position, then he's the person applying the process. But then if you come in from the the, the employee's perspective, okay, what what is all this interview about? That's a question the person is trying to answer. What what are they looking for? That is the what is the purpose of that is the, what is going on in this place. Basically, that's the sort of questions we want to we want some light on. Okay, so once you select your um, candidate pool, for example, um, that's when you do the selection. selection. Okay, so selection is where you are talking about interviews. Mm -hmm. Now, there are different forms of interviews. We can have uh, panel interviews, and within the panel interviews, there are structured interviews and unstructured interviews. So let's start with uh, panel interview. Panel interviews is usually a group of people who sit together with a candidate and ask the candidate questions. And um, normally, all of these panel will be subject matter experts in different ways, depending on what you are uh, uh, recruiting for, they will have their unique questions that they want to ask you. But in a structured interview, every candidate is going to be asked the same question. So for example, you come in and we ask you, what is your name? Tell us about yourself and why you want to work with this organization. So every candidate will be asked the same question. So it, it is important that a, a candidate coming in must also be able to dist distinguish themselves. So how you sell yourself, just in the same way that employer must brand itself well to be an employer of choice. When you come in for an interview, you must be a candidate of choice. You should be able to tell us your unique qualities. Apart from, so again, let me focus on students because I believe this presentation goes to students, right? Um, graduate students. And so if you are a candidate looking for a job and you go for a job interview, tell us about yourself. Yes, you tell, it's already on your CV what your name is and everything. But what you can do to distinguish yourself is your unique qualities. And I think I mentioned some of them. What are you strong at? You have strong interpersonal skills, strong communication skills. You are um, uh, technology savvy. And so you can handle all our, uh, you can manage our social media platforms, for example, for us. And social media management, social media sales, social media presence is becoming a very important um, skill or competency that organizations are looking out for in all candidates because everything else is now moving from the traditional um, bring your CV, uh, hard paper, yeah. we're going to screen it, onto how we can sell, how we can project brand image on social media platforms. So people with this kind of skill is critical for the organization. Well, you must also project yourself, as I said, as a purposeful person. You don't come and giggle um, your way through the interview and say that you give me the job and I know I can do it. No, we don't know you can do it. This is the time to sell yourself. And anything you have that is unique and different from what everybody else has, because again, as I'm saying, we're speaking with graduate students, so everybody will have a degree. But what else you have aside your degree or what else can you do with your degree? These are the things that you're looking for. So in structured interviews, we ask every candidate the same thing. And how we assess a candidate is how one candidate is able to distinguish themselves so much from the others by bringing out their unique qualities and how they can leverage on whatever the company has on uh, to their own qualities and competencies to achieve organizational value and re results. So that is what we look out for. In an unstructured interview, every um, uh, panel member is free to ask whatever question. And most of the time, the questions that they will ask would depend on how the candidate responds to each question that is asked. So you can build on questions as uh, depending on how you 
you, you respond. And it's important that you are able to respond meaningfully, objectively, and intelligently to ask questions that are unrelated to the job that you are recruiting for. And that is something that um, panel members or interviewers must always bear in mind. You have no business asking about their personal lives and their median names and where they came from and so on and so forth. It must be specific to the jobs that you're looking and interviewing the candidates for. And so again, I said that the, how the interview will progress, how it will make it interesting, all depends on the responses of the, of the candidates. If your responses are sharp, um, I think that it will encourage the panel members to be more inquisitive and probe more and try and bring out the qualities in you, the special potential in you that perhaps you are not able to bring out. But, you know, the panel, the duty, the job of the panel is also to help you bring out the potential in you. Some candidates present themselves timid, but if you're able to guide them through, you realize that they are really able to then uh, quietly, calmly bring out the potential that they have. Some people will come, they are all loud and rattling many things, but not making any sense at all. And so it is all about the candidate preparing themselves. Now, when you're going for a job interview, depending on which organization you are going into, you must learn research about the organization, learn the past, the history of the organization, the current strategic direction of the, of the organization, how the company has been able to be an industry leader, how it projected itself, you know, some of the unique uh, capabilities of that organization, why that organization is an employer of choice. These are all things you must know. And, and these are things available on the internet. You know, the annual reports of the, organi of the organization you must be able to pick it and read it and be able to ask questions or based on your own knowledge and understanding, perhaps deduce what the annual statement is telling you and how you understand it and how you think it can be improved. Some areas that the company is not doing well, for example, you can offer certain ideas on what you think they can do to improve on the organization. So these are things that you must prepare yourself with um, as you go for a job interview. You cannot go there and sit there, they ask you, tell us what you know about the organization and say, well, I don't know much, I'm here to learn. And so if you give me the opportunity, I'll be able to come in and learn and learn fast. That is not the kind of um, conversation we want to have when you're looking for um, students to now, some students believe so much in, the, in, in themselves that they don't prepare, and that's the biggest mistake they make. You must prepare. No matter how basic the job is, how you stand out is what will give you the job. And so at every point in time, it's important that you prepare. So that is how we go about uh, the, the, the selection um, um, process and when we do select we must be able to tell you within a short period of time whether you are successful or you are not successful when some organization go the next month to tell you why you are not successful sometimes it's to say that you were not able to articulate your competencies well enough you were not able to demonstrate to us that you actually have done research into the organization that you want to be belong to um, so if you want to belong to Ecobank and you don't have a clue, the business of Ecobank, you don't even know that we are a Pan-African bank. You don't know that we were the first to develop a mobile app on the, on the banking industry in Ghana and so on and so forth. Then how do you become a member of Ecobank? You must show the interest. And so we give feedback and you must go and re retool yourself for the next interview that you go to that you don't take anything for granted at all. So I hope that I've been able to address that question as well in terms of the election. Okay. When do you, when do you um, in what circumstances, or when do you use, I think that's the question, to use the um, um, aptitude test and other things? Like that? Because it's not becoming a common practice in many organizations, the recruitment processes, that, and that sort of thing, and also in the, some, sometimes even the selection process as well. Okay, okay. So, yes, go, go on. So, for, for graduate trainee recruitment, for example, 
the aptitude test could be part of your recruitment process, not your selection yes. process. Yes, Remember, yes. We, are trying to sift, we are trying to sift out um, certain qualities from the others. And so it is at the point where we see that we have, we're looking for graduates. Everybody is a graduate. Now, what makes this graduate unique and different from the other graduates? That's when you bring your aptitude test, your reasoning test, your verbal uh, test. And so when you do that, you are now able to determine that, yes, all of these are graduates, but this person has a level, a certain level of reasoning capability, aptitude that is a bit different from what the others have. And so we use um, as aptitude tests to tr as part of the recruitment process to screen and further uh, sift out um, candidates and end up with a pool of strong, very qualified and competent people that we think we can take through the next level, which is the um, selection process. Now, within the selection process as well, you have a pool. So you're looking for maybe 100 people to hire, and then you've got 200 people that you have uh, shortlisted into your applicant pool. You need to go further by screening. And there we have assessment centers, for example, where we give case studies to the candidates. So we say we give you a case study to, to read and analyze. And we say, so if you were in this situation, how would you address this problem? There again, you are sifting it down, shrinking the numbers further because somebody will come with very intelligent um, responses to how a business, a real business scenario will be uh, addressed. And some of them will simply be clueless. So that is when you realize that there are candidates who are first class students, but it's just in theory. Yes. Okay. okay. The person. Who that's exactly that's one upside I wanted to also. You yeah, want to explain? Wait. Um. At what point do you place emphasis on the classification of the degree? So the degree is <laughs> based first class, second upper, what um, say, um yes, lower, yes. and when do you at what point? Or, or, or when do you put the uh, do you put emphasis on that one when at which part of the process or um... okay so for example if you're looking for graduate trainees and you are looking to bring in trainee recruits them management graduate trainees for example to come into your organization then the degree uh, the, the degree is important. What you've got, the class of degree you've got is important. So most organizations will say we're looking um, to hire, we're looking for candidates who at attain a first class or second class upper. That is important when you're looking for graduate trainees because in graduate trainees, you want to invest so much again into their development and actually propel or fast track their development in the organization. So you are assuming that these people are academically sound and also on the business uh, uh, platforms too, they'll be equally sound. And so at that level, you're looking to be specific on the type of degree or the qualification they must, the minimum uh, qualification degrees, uh, classes they must have. So you can have first class and second, up, um, second upper, uh, first class and upper, yes. But if you're looking to hire general a general pool of applicants to come into your organization because again I said that for example you want to expand and so you want to be everywhere within Ghana you want to be a household name the degree and what you've got is not necessarily relevant now for the let me go back to the graduate trainee again you want to say that you're looking for people with STEM background, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, back, math, mathematics background. And so you are specific because you're looking for them for a specific role to drive a specific strategy in your organization. So that you are very specific. Now, when you're looking to expand your sales network, and so you want to be everywhere where you want to deploy uh, sales agents or representatives of your organization across a country, you are not so particular about whether they got a first class or a second class or even a third class. What you're looking for are people who are able to speak, communicate, and sell. But you want to also say that your minimum qualification is a degree. And so for everybody who must come into that space for you to consider 
for that job must be a graduate. And so you get your graduate. And so um, the degree is important as a minimum basic qualification, but depending on what we're using you for in the, as part of the organization strategy, we now drill down to whether we're looking for STEM, people with the STEM background, people with first class and second class degree, or just mass recruitment where your unique skills, competencies, and abilities will come to play because we can train you to deliver on what you're looking for. When you're looking for the management trainees, we are trying to leverage on what the skills they have and complement them with your internal recruitment and your internal development, training and development strategies. But for the mass recruitment, you just want to have people who are able to immediately hit the ground running by being sales advocates for you and be able to really drive home the kind of household name you want for your organization. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, can you turn the lights on? Okay. Yeah. So you can now, yeah, yes, move on and then you can. Okay, so again, when recruitment, and really I focused my presentation on recruitment because that was a topic you gave me and yeah. I also made it quite clear that yeah. recruitment is different from selection, but yeah. I realized that you want me to perhaps um, talk about both yeah, a bit as I go on. Yeah. Uh, exactly, and I will do that. So um, when we talk of recruitment as well, again, as I said, for any organization, you need to, the supply, remember we talked about the supply of, the supply of workforce. Now the supply, the workforce supply actually means the pool of talent you currently have in your organization. So it depends on your workforce supply that will determine whether you are going to recruit internally or you're going to recruit externally. If you have a good pool within your organization, it means that you have a good supply of candidates in your organization. Therefore, there may not be a critical need to go out there and recruit. So why is internal recruitment important? Internal recruitment is important because it improves the morale of the people, the present employees in your organization, because you know that if there are positions, you are considering them first. And so everybody knows that there's a clear career for them to progress to the next level in the organization. So internal recruitment is good because then everybody knows that if I work hard within this organization, when there are vacancies, I will be the one to be considered. It also rewards performance of the current employees. And so hardworking employees are always considered for job opportunities that come, especially when they are higher rules within the organization. So that's why it's important that you consider uh, recruiting your supply of, of workforce, recruiting from your supply of workforce in the organization. It's also cost effective because you've already recruited these people. They are part of your, of your, of your cost, already cost. So you need not to invest again in going out there to go through a recruitment process, a screening process, and so on and so forth to get a, a new pool of candidates, which you would have to now go through an orientation and onboarding, which is all cost and time consuming, and so on and so forth. So those are some of the advantages of uh, recruit. And it improves your um, overall employee experience because employees know that in this organization, if I prove myself, then the company also rewards me by promoting me for vacancies that come in. Now, the disadvantage of internal recruitment is that it can produce organizational inbreeding. So everything we know, if I should use my bank as an example, if we continue to recruit only from within, all we know is banking and we don't bring in any fresh and new ideas from other industries. Uh, if you recruit, for example, uh, and, and so it's important that every now and then you go out to recruit so that you bring in fresh ideas, new energies coming in. It builds competition actually within the current setup because people are coming with diverse background and they are proving to be quite unique and different from you. And so the current workforce will now try to live up to the expectation or you know, you know, step up their game to be able to ensure that they also, you know, um, 
um, are on the radar when it comes to competencies and skills and how to deliver. The disadvantage, again, is that it's a heavy burden on training and development because if you're looking for people who are IT technology savvy, for example, and you're, we didn't start, if I should take the bank again as an example, we didn't start as a bank that transacts online. And so we would typically not have people with online um, digital uh, mindset yes. to develop apps and to be able to actually use the uh, digital platforms to transact. And so we have to now invest a lot into training and developing the current workforce to be able to come at speed with what um, society or the world is, is, is uh, confronting us with now which is to be able to use platforms and transact digitally and be able to do banking, not in brick and mortar banking, but to transact and do banking online. So these are the heavy investments in terms of training and development that organizations are confronted with when they decide to only recruit internally, okay, especially for skills that are not readily available. And it may cause political infighting. If recruitment is only done within the organization, then people begin to be um, uh, play politics. People begin to be um, stooges and bootleg people, you know, just so that they, are, they find favor and get promoted into jobs that are becoming uh, vacant and not necessarily because they are capable and competent. And that is not what you're looking for in a multinational organization. And indeed, for any organization that is serious, you must have a blend of in-house in, uh, in recruitment as well as external recruitment. Now, let's talk about external recruitment. And here is where, for students, you'll be more interested in because you are outside and you are looking to inject fresh ideas and new ideas into the system. So you just need to be able to prepare yourself for the labor market such that Aside your degree, you must build yourself, invest more in yourself by, you know, looking at some of the things we've talked about. Now, the world is moving digital, so you must be able to have some kind of knowledge and skill and capability in some kind of technological know-how, or even if you are in training, how to now conduct training using all the teams and the applications, how to set up chat rooms and, and, and meeting rooms, on uh, using the, the digital platforms or, or, or the online uh, platforms such that you can train a wide range of people and make the simulations still feel as if they are in the classroom. You need to be able to use the features that are available uh, to conduct these kind of training. So you just have to build up on your skills. So we are also saying that it introduces um, uh, competition and competence into the organization. And it also brings cross industry insights. And so instead of just recruiting from banks, no, you are bringing in people from manufacturing, you are bringing people from insurance, you are bringing people from uh, IT and technology. Just to add to your pool, it improves communication, it improves diversity, it improves skills and competence. That is what you're looking for. And it may reduce training costs because the person has already acquired their own. Uh, skills that you need already and you don't need to invest in any more immediate training the person has come equipped and already well trained and so you leverage on that and you you know you grow your organization the disadvantage however is that it may reduce morale in the organization people the workforce in the organization will say oh but you can also train me or I've also trained myself and I can use uh, the platforms to transact why are you recruiting new people and you know they may feel it will take away a bit of the employee experience and you know the morale of of um of the uh, current employee it also bring about longer orientation and onboarding i mean when anybody comes into the organization you take them through um onboarding and orientation and so you spend quite a number of time um helping them to assimilate into the the organization and that's time consuming and it's cost because during that time if it's going to take about two months it means that it's two months of unproductive um uh, un unproductiveness from 
the person that you have hired. Meanwhile, you're going to use that two months also while doing the orientation. You are paying that person for perhaps no work done. So it's quite a, a, a process as well, and it, it's a cost to the organization. So some those are some of the disadvantages. But I think that for um, students, as we are speaking to students, it's important that aside your degree, just you know, add more, add value, invest more into the special skills and competencies that you can add to your degree, such that you will be relevant at any uh, job interview. And also you must target the kind of industry you want to work in. If you are targeting banking, we've already talked about how banks are, are now uh, going digital. You must be able to know banking, but at the same time, leverage on now the new way of banking. What is the new way of banking? It is digital banking. What can you do that is different? If you want to go into sales, yes, people are now doing more online sales. How can you um, use your skills, technology skills that you have, to sell online, to attract more people online? How do you um, set up um, um, accounts online sites that you can get people to or link payment systems onto your online account or your organization online account such that you can continue to sell and market your product and all the proceeds will go straight into your company or your organization's um, accounts and so on and so forth. So these are things you should just you know, be able to learn and add to the degree that you are pursuing. Um, I think that we've talked about most of these things. And as I said, because we were uh, focusing more on, on recruitment, we have talked more about how the process of recruitment goes. But at the end of the recruitment process is the selection that we are talking about. Okay, what we do is to then identify the best of candidates we have had from the pool of candidates through the recruitment exercise and go through um, the interview process as, as, I, as I have already mentioned, the types of interviews. But the most important thing is that to be able to be selected for any job at all in any organization, it is for you to be able to sell yourself. Sell yourself like a product. You know, you are selling yourself as a product that is attractive and a product that is of value. If you're able to sell and present yourself, first of all, by learning the organization, about the organization, and then also understanding your own strengths and weaknesses, your own strengths and weaknesses, and prepare to present yourself at the interview panel, I have no doubt that whatever job interview that you go to, you will stand a good chance of being selected because you have learned about yourself and you have learned about the organization and you're able to respond to the needs of the uh, panel and thereby addressing the needs of the organization and for the reason why they are recruiting for any position. So I think basically this is what um, uh, multinationals and most organizations go through in selecting um, applicants, candidates who are looking for jobs. And, you know, at the end of the day, how it will be successful is first of all, the organization strategizing to find out what you're looking for. And for the candidates, it's for you to prepare for the organization. In any job market that you're going to, please learn about the industry that you're going into. It's important that you learn about the industry you're going into and then you know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you cannot go and sell yourself at an interview session. So know yourself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Tell the panel what you bring to the table and how they can use what you bring to the table to drive the objective of the organization. So thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any further questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, uh, in fact, I just wanted to um, okay, what do we have to do? You've given us the advice that we need that we uh, are about to ask for. Um, okay, yes, for, uh, for example, or a question too, 
Um, how many times do you let say do recruitment um, in a year? Uh, basically, um, let, let's take it, let's say for that one. Yes, um, there's just once in a year, twice, a uh, bi annual, and sort of thing that you do. Or let's say. Okay, so if you are specifically speaking, um, wanting to know about Ecobank, I don't think any organization says we recruit uh, twice a year or okay. three times a year. It depends on the need. Oh, so right. it depends on your supply of workforce. Yeah, if you have enough I'm workforce, the okay. strategy, yes, the strategy has not changed much. If the strategy has not changed, you are not expanding. And also if you're expanding and you have enough workforce, you don't need to recruit because recruitment is cost. Yes. Although recruitment ultimately brings revenue because you're going to use people to drive the strategy to bring in income. It is also a lot of cost. And yes. so if you have, and now because technology is playing a major role in um, how organization produce outputs, you are actually, working with employees who can do more, achieve more with less workforce. You are building an organization to build, to, to, to grow or to derive more output from less resources. We are shrinking our structures such that we leverage more on the platforms and use less people. Now, when you, see, when you say you use less people, you're not using less people to say that you are declaring redundancy. You are now building their competencies to now go to the back end to support the platforms. Okay, okay so the same people are being used to support platforms, but in an organization that is currently expanding in the growth stage where it expands. So recruitment in any organization also will depend on the level of the phase, the, the growth stage of the organization. So as you, as you, as an organization uh, reaches the growth stage, you need to expand, and so perhaps you need more um, hands. And so your strategy will be recruiting different groups of people at different times to meet the need of the organization. But I don't think any organization specific, especially if they are not to the growth stage, will say. I'm going to recruit twice a year, three times a year. If you have the supply of skills, you don't need to go out there to recruit. But when you do have to recruit, then you go through the recruitment processes that we have outlined to make sure that you're attracting the best quality um, into your workforce because a wrong recruitment will mess up your entire uh, strategy. Now, online is key. That's one thing we have to, online, being the internet and being, yes, uh, survey being an uh, online survey is an important part of it as everything is going online there's a, people are virtually be, becoming by uh, companies you have both brick and mortar and also click and then that sort of the the, the, the clicks will also have to be so you need to build up that skill alongside whatever you have as a um, a graduate of any um, repute to be able to get into yes. <laughs> yes yes and also another thing i would like to remind students of is what you post on the social media because at the end of the day the background checks and all that come to play we will be checking on you what you do on social media and you must always project yourself above board you must always be somebody who is posting insightful, meaningful things. You must not present yourself as a cantankerous character or somebody who posts empty posts um, that do not bring value to anyone, you know. So organizations are looking for purposeful people. And so if you are posting, just make sure that the record is there. And so as part of your selection process, people will check on what you have done. And if it's not a good record, you may have a good application. You may have all the nice, ticked all the nice boxes of a, a first class, a second class upper, and so on and so forth. But that alone can drop, um, make us drop, um, you know, take you off of the potential candidate list. Yeah. I think basically that is all. Um, Only 10 candidates. Okay. Yes, 
I think that's basically that is uh, thank you very much for responding to our invitation and what we have to do is usually because it's a course we also have to share a little bit of it. a quick one just hold it no not this one not this one yes okay um, and then we just stop sharing Oh, why? No, just for the those who are the production people to know how um, we get to the end of it and all that. Now, the final bit, you, you, you have to give us a, a little bit of a, a write-up, a, a profile about yourself, just a paragraph, half page or something about yourself. That is it. Did you? Okay, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I thought, thought I sent that. Oh, you sent that? Okay, then let me check. Let me, let me, let me. Please yes. check. If, if you one. haven't received that, received if you haven't one. received that, I will I will resend it to you. But I thought already. I sent that already. Already. Let me know. I will send it to you. Uh, so that we know. Yes. Uh, you know, we need also have to let them know uh, the person who is speaking, and then just to get a little bit of a background on that. Yes. But That's we all really right. Appreciate. Yes. We really appreciate. Yes. Okay. And, uh, we will later on. We have other. Um, the experiential learning part for, for the, um, the graduates for uh, uh, middle level etc and we hope that we would maybe they would like to have uh, a face-to-face -face sort of an encounter sort of thing and we would call on you uh, yes uh, at the appropriate that's time fine. Yes, uh, that's because fine of the that's... COVID, because of the covid and everything yeah, we have to be careful with all the protocols yes. and all that yes, yes. Uh, and this, <laughs> this particular one is going to um, about a thousand two hundred students. That's what we are looking okay. at from all, from all the campuses. We share it with all our students from Takrade, Kumasi, Tema, and all at the same time. So we are leveraging on uh, the online. We call the learning management system to get them oh. videos for them to be able to. Learn. That's good. Yes, that's what we're doing. Okay then. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I've had a few, uh, no, a couple of my mates actually were with them, uh, with the band. Um, okay. Joanna, Joanna Mensa. Yes, she's still with the band. Uh, yes, Joanna, yes, Joanna was my mate at Legon. And, uh, yeah. And Colin, I don't know how, what, what he, I've known, I'm told he's left. Uh, uh, okay, but he was with uh, Colin. Um, Colin Brimer. Yes, Brahma, yes, uh, secondary school, yes. Yes, the Shiro. We, we, at that time, we were calling him yes, with, with the Shiro, yes, he was my uh -huh. yeah, to secondary school. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. He's left the bank. Yes, okay, do we say, no, okay, my son, I know him <laughs> very well. Yeah. Whenever else you want me to share whatever that um, you want us to impact to the students, because that we'd be happy to do that. Okay, then. Thank you.